Last week, uh, uh, Gary talked about what next. That was his sermon title, What Next? And so I'm going to piggyback on that in a sense, or I'm going to uh, link up to that. And the sermon title that, I, that uh, I have today is Let's Consider Your Options. <laughs> Let's Consider Your Options. And that's not actually just an, an interesting title that I figured out to make it link to Gary. That's actually the first part of a scripture verse. It comes out of the book of Isaiah. And uh, in uh, the first chapter, and verse 18, and I'm going to read verses 18 through 20 of Isaiah right now. And what I want to do is I want to give some practical application. Uh, I'm also, like I said at the very beginning, we're trying to accomplish something that is giving and meeting different people at their interest level. Some of y'all just simply want the practical application. You don't care about the other part, how we got there, but others are very interested in how you got there. And so I spent some time on that. That's not just me trying to show off. That's me actually taking some time to let you know why you got where, how we get there. Because there are people that are very motivated by that. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, Tony told me he took 15 pages of notes or something, or five pages. He's a note taker. He's very interested in, in the details of how you get someplace. And that really can be a something that... that uh, when, when I'm talking about roots and reasons for things, don't just shut off and say, well, that's just that highfalutin, smarty-ass talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one of the skeptics' main arguments when I get into discussions with skeptics. Oh, you just think you know more and are better than anybody else. No, I don't. No, I don't. But there is reason behind things. And when we get a hold of the reason, sometimes it gives a stronger foundation for what we are saying in theory that we believe. And this general statement out here is supported by the Word. There's just really nothing more important than the Word that is illumined by the Holy Spirit. And there's something extremely important about meditating in the Word, researching the Word, pondering the Word, or else God wouldn't have told Joshua, a war general in charge of millions of people, uh, very, very busy, that your success is going to come from you meditating in the Word, continually having it always on your mind. So that's not the same thing as reading a verse a day to keep the devil away. But that is taking the Word seriously enough to actually delve into it. It's not a legalism that says, oh, you better read your Bible or else, you know, you're going to go to hell. Or God's not going to like you as much. See, some people do the different kinds of devotional things, Deborah, because they have this motivation inside that tells them, if I don't do this, God isn't going to like me as much, and so I can't expect him to do what he wants to do for me. As if what I'm doing is actually going to bribe him. You don't need to bribe God, thus saith the Lord. You do not need to bribe God. Now, let's look at that scripture. Isaiah 1, 18 to 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, then you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. It does not say, I will eat you by the sword. He says, this is the result of walking out away from me. Okay? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. All right. I'm going to throw these fancy words again. In this particular thing where he's saying, come now, he's actually giving you a choice. It's in what's called the call imperative. Imperative means it's serious. It's not something to be taken lightly. But call means that it gives you a choice. It's a simple, it's a simple statement. 
Now, if it had been in the Hephael imperative, like our original verse was, it would have had the indication that he was coming over and he was, he's more, more telling you, pick yourself up. In fact, I'll help you pick yourself up and get you over here. But it isn't. There is a choice in the matter. There are options. Now, there's always fruit, regardless of the option you're taking. Which do you want? What, I want behind door one or door two. You know, you've seen that, that TV show. Well, sometimes people get lucky. Are you going to bet on door one or door two? And so they bet their $5,000 on door one because behind either one or two, there's going to be something much more valuable than $5,000. But uh, behind the other door, there's a year time supply of toilet paper. It's a zone. So therefore, what are your options? Well, you have a right. Come on. It's, it's saying, this is serious. It's imperative. It's serious. This is something, don't brush this off. This is really important. But you do have an option. But recognize that there are, there's results of your options, the, the options you choose. Now, what he's speaking here, what Isaiah is speaking is to Judah. And Judah is a tribe that had been, become very rebellious against the Lord. And things were getting worse and worse, and they were becoming more and more idolatrous and rebellious. And so he was saying, okay, here, we got a serious situation going on. And so i got to talk to you about that, and you've got to come, come over to me, come out of your environment, come away from everything that's taking all of your attention all of the time, Come away from your concern for your family in the good times. Come away from your concern for this, that, and the other. Your job, your ministry, anything else. There's stuff, stuff going on we need to talk about. So come to me so we can talk about it. But, he says, let us reason together. And so many people have thought that that means, let's think about what is the right doctrines to believe. What is the right thought processes you see, that the Pharisees were reasoners. The Pharisees were getting into fights, and that's why Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures, because in them you think you have eternal life. In other words, if you investigate that, you'll find out that what he was talking to them about was the fact that they were finding arguments to argue with each other over. And so it is saying you're finding points of argument out of the Bible because you think in winning your argument, in being right, you're going to find eternal life. And that's not what the scriptures are for. The scriptures are to point to me, not win doctrinal arguments. Amen. So what does reason actually mean? It actually means to consider the options. That's what it means. Come now. This is important. Some, some stuff's going on, and you stay on the path you're on right now, and you're only going to reap more and more stress and death. You're, because you're walking away from me. Not because I'm going to get you for leaving me, but because that's a natural result of you walking away from life, is reaping death. The natural result of you looking to the flesh or looking to the devil, all the flesh and the devil can give you is death. Now there's a scripture verse that uh, relates to the message that we had back at Easter or Resurrection Sunday morning. And that scripture verse says this, why do you seek the living among the dead? And that's got an application right now. Because he said, why, the angel said, to Mary, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Now, if the angel came in and stood in front of some of us today, in fact, probably all of us on one level or another, the angel might say that same thing. Why are you seeking the living? Why are you seeking life among principles of death? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Only life can give you life. So why are you seeking life by things that actually lead to corruption? That actually lead to anxiety and stress and fear? That actually lead to fighting and quarrels? 
Why do you seek to be right and the satisfaction of having peace and rightness and wholeness in life by wandering around and mucking around in the ways of death? You will only find life from life. Thus saith the Lord. That death cannot give life. There's some options. So we need to talk about this, he said. Come now, let us consider, seriously consider, your options. Though the sins that you have right now, and by the way, here, some of it was the big bad sins from the big bad sinners. But sin is anything that is not of faith. Now let me explain what faith is, Tony, because we have all kinds of definitions of faith. Faith is having supreme confidence in God. It is not having supreme confidence in the words that he spoke. Because they are there to lead you to God as the source of those words. And a lot of pe people are trying to have faith for things because they are memorizing positive scripture verses and then they are trying to put confidence in those words. How are they trying to put confidence in the words? Well, because they go through some ritual of saying them over and over and over again or praying them over and over and over again. And the fact of the matter is, is that what's going on there a lot of times is that they are having faith in the God who said the words. But what I'm doing right now is suggesting that you get your mind away from fo focusing on specific words of Scripture verses as promises that you could approach as positive mental attitude and focus as you are believing what he said is because he said it. Amen. Not because the words you read are saying it. It's because he said it. What makes faith faith? Skeptical, so, skeptics will try to tell you that faith is just having any belief about anything that you can't prove. That's not true. That is not biblical faith. That's not faith as, by, as God is describing it. True faith, and then they'll, then they'll throw up the example of, eh, if you believe in the flying spaghetti monster, or a brass teapot, or a pink unicorn. Well, nobody believes in a flying spaghetti monster. It's, it's really a, an absurd analogy that they make, but it points to a misunderstanding. Faith is supreme confidence that the one who spoke it can perform it. And not just simply focusing on the words itself, or else you could just be functioning by positive mental attitude. And a lot of people that say that they're walking in faith are actually just trying to stay positive. That's okay to stay positive. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to stay positive, but it's how you get to staying positive is what is important and what you're using to stay positive. So he says, come and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall become as wool. Now, if... Here's your options, <coughs> door one or door two. Because there are only two doors. You obey him or you walk away from him. There's not any door in between. It's not complicated. There's two options. You serve the Lord or you don't. You love the Lord or you don't. You have faith in God or you don't. There aren't two options, more than two options. There aren't variations of one of. of you know, so I've got, well, ten choices. Really, basically, it's one of two. Door one or door two. Then, if you are willing and obedient, what does that mean? 
Well, I know a lot of kids who have been told to apologize to their brother because they did something to them. I said, apologize to your brother. Sorry. <laughs> well, technically speaking, they obeyed, right? But they didn't obey, right? right? It's like the little kid that says, that keeps standing up in her high chair. The little baby keeps standing up in the high chair. Mom says, sit down. I'm not going to tell you again. Sits her down. She stands up. Sits her down. Stands up. Sits her down. Mom finally feels, because she doesn't try to stand up again, she finally feels, I won. Yay, I'm a good parent. I won. All the time, the little kid is saying, I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> if you be willing and obedient. In other words, the word willing is if you, de if you desire to follow after him, you're doing it because you want to follow him. You want to follow him. Not just simply his ways. You learn to do that by following his ways. That's the detail of following him. But if you decide to obey because your heart says, you know what, this is the desire of my heart. Remember the scripture verse that we used out of Proverbs that says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Mm -hmm. The word picture on delight there is to make yourself tender toward. Make yourself tender toward the Lord. Like a, one of the words that's translated there is actually a, like a princess. Now that's not something that goes down real good with man. Make yourself, Kyle, like a princess. There you go. Why don't you put that in there? Make yourself like a princess. Tenderize yourself to the Lord. Oh, I don't know if I can tenderize my... Yeah, you can. You tenderize yourself to anything you want to. You know, you get a, a mad on for somebody, but then for some, something hits your heart and you just soften right up to them, right? You can tenderize yourself. You can delight yourself. You can do what you do in obedience because your primary motivation is to the, you delight in the Lord. You desire. I desire in my gut. I desire to be a God follower. That's the desire of my heart. And then interestingly enough, the word obey, Shema, that's the same word that means that they have a prayer every day. That means that I'm dedicating myself to follow the one true God. So it's if you desire, and, and the word is also translated here, or obedient, here. But in, in, in the Hebrew language and in the Hebrew people, when they heard the word here, they, they heard it like the parent who says to, his, to the child, clean your room. That child is expecting, uh, being expected to listen to the parent's words and do them. Are you listening to me? Are you hearing me? If you're not cle cleaning up your room, you may be hearing auditory sounds, but if you are not acting on what you are hearing, you're not hearing me. And so this is what he is saying, basically, delight in, hear what he has to say, but act on it. I desire, I desire to follow after God. It's the desire of my heart to be his child who walks after him because I have confidence and trust in him. And therefore, because of that and out of that desire... I listen to what he has to say with the attitude that as soon as he says it, I'm going to do it. Or there is actually an option there. And it was the option that Pharaoh took. And the option that Pharaoh took was, okay, I'll let him go tomorrow morning. In other words, I will spend another night with the frogs. In other words, he was asking the Lord that he, okay, I'll, I'll follow through, I'm going to delay. So he's giving you the option, okay, you know, don't respond right now. 
So as soon as you respond, that's when you're obeying, not because you're thinking about it. And I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Thinking about it. Being in agreement with and not acting upon is not obedience. Thinking about without acting upon is not obedience. And if a person has a particular medication that they're taking and they've been prescribed, and if they don't take it, they're going to get more and more seriously ill, it can sit on their, uh, their, their table on the bedpost overnight when they stick the gum on the bedpost overnight. You know that old song. Anyway. <laughs> They can have that bottle of pills sitting in, in the kitchen or next to their vitamins or they can sit and they can think about taking it. Or, you know what, Donna, we're, you know, we're on a path. In fact, uh, uh, Tony and Helen are also on the same path. It's called Yoli. It's a particular better, it's called the better body system. It's a kind of diet, but it's not a diet. It's all, it's all about getting your health better. If, if you want to talk to somebody about that, talk to Donna about it. But uh, we've been on that, and it, you know, there are people I read on the website that is where I'm a member, where Donna made us members, of people that talk about the fact that they they got their pack and they're thinking about doing it. It doesn't do them any good until they start taking it. No matter how well it works, and it does. Just in two weeks, I already feel a lot better. I'm Ten pounds lighter. <laughs> but it's actually acting it's actually acting upon it you know what I cannot Lorraine you have the potential for miracles in your life and working miracles and healings and so forth I can lay hands on you I can rub the hair off the top of your head I cannot activate miracles in you until you activate them Amen. with your own actions we use that phrase sometimes, but we, that's not really what's happening. It's as soon as you activate it, as soon as you take steps to obey. All right, so you will eat the good of the land. That seems like a good promise to me. What's the option? You will eat the bad of the land. Door one, good land. Door two, bad land. Those are the only options. The choices you will make this week are from door one, good land, or door two, bad land. It's that simple. So consider your options. Consider them seriously instead of still living the same habit pattern that you go on from day to day to day to day. All right, let me jump to John 15 and 7. This is the last scripture. I got a lot more on here, but I, you know, I'm not one of those preachers that if I've got 10 pages of notes, I've got to finish them. Because I've got them. So I'm only going to use one more scripture. It's John 15, 7. This is Tony. This is a mind blowing verse. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it will be done for you. Yes. Now, what does it mean to abide in? You know, dwell in, come to rest in. You know, you, are, you have come to rest in him and he has come to rest in you. His words are just comfortable and at home in you. And there's not any attitude about, okay, when something better comes along or... Some other distraction comes up. I'm going to go ahead and take myself away from this. It is just a, it's a process of learning. Now, it's a process of learning. Okay? It, it, we're always looking for the destination. It's a journey, folks. But it's a long journey in the same direction. And you need, some of y'all, this includes me, some of y'all need to consider the words that are coming out of your mouth based upon the critical judgments you're making about things around you. Don't pray for the city and curse the city at the same time. Hallelujah. Praise God. Or with anything else. Make the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart acceptable in the sight of the Lord. 
If the Lord was visibly standing with you and you had been appealing to him about anything, would you say what you just said in his hearing? Amen. Abide in me and my words abide in you and you shall ask what you will. Now, there, okay, here we go. Smarty Pants is going to give you a Greek thing here. You shall ask what you will is in the middle voice. It means that you shall ask what you will for yourself. Not for other people. You shall ask what you will for yourself. And it shall be done unto you. Kyle, there's the cool word. That word is only used three times in the New Testament. Translated done in English. Two of them, one of them is a duplication in a different gospel. So actually it's used twice in John. And what it means is this. It is a miracle word. It means... You shall ask, if my, you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask for yourself what you will, and I will create it if it doesn't exist presently. A lot of people get hung up on the fact that I can believe God as far as what is, I know is possible, but if it, it goes outside the realm of possible, well, first of all, a lot of times your own thinking is too limited. But the fact is, this is an extreme case this is saying, if what you need, or if the circumstances are such, you're abiding in me and I'm abiding in you, and it's all dead. It doesn't even exist. It's not even possible, because it's not substantive. It's not there. It doesn't exist. It would have to be created for you. Amen. He will. Now, this is where I'm going to put out a challenge to each one of us. I would like you to begin to consider your options, first of all, about becoming even more serious about considering door one. But secondly, my wife and I have started for ourselves, and then we're also thinking in terms of, for the church too, but we're thinking in terms of what actual miracles, I don't mean the big things, I mean miracles do I need in my life. And making ourselves personal miracle lists. There are some of you that, some of y'all folks that live downtown, you ought to be jumping on this right now. Because you're at a disadvantage because what you need is not even possible and it will require a miracle. So therefore, therefore, remember, it is you first coming to him and letting his words be a total influence in your life. Not the influence of all of the scandal that goes on around you and all of the insults or all of that nonsense or all of that other BS that just flows without any resistance. It seems like especially in a downtown environment, but really anywhere, just all kinds of nonsense. Fightings and rumors and scandals and gossips and lies after lies after lies. But the thing is, you don't focus on that. Because it's happening, that's happening to everybody. You have a choice to make. Turn that off and focus on God or just keep sucking your thumb about what's happening to you. You can suck your thumb until your thumb falls off and your circumstances aren't going to change. But if you'll begin appealing to God, the creator of the universe, the one who said, I can actually create things that don't even exist for you, if you will come to me and, and be in my heart, in my words, in your heart, as a way of life, not as a Sunday morning spiritual get-together kind of thing to do. If you'll do that, you can begin expecting things to be created that haven't been even in existence. So therefore, my wife and I are doing the miracle book. 
And it's something that we will add to a long time because I don't think we'll ever give this up because our society is very heavily influenced. Who was it that wrote the Declaration of Independence? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Declaration of Independence, primary author that's given credit is Thomas Jefferson. He is a deist. He is a self-confessed deist, but he is also a self-confessed, guess what? Disciple of Jesus Christ. There is something known as the Jefferson Bible. The Jefferson Bible is a book that Thomas Jefferson put together because he said the teachings of Jesus are sublimely eloquent. So therefore, what Thomas Jefferson did was he cut out every miraculous occurrence or reference in the New Testament in the words of Jesus and in the life of Jesus. He cut out the virgin birth. He cut out anything that had to do with the miraculous and left only the moral teachings of Jesus. Here's part of the problem is that he was also a proponent and a champion of what was called the Age of Enlightenment, which is the Age of Reason, which is reason over revelation. Reason, reasoning, intellectual reasoning dominates in importance fairy tale revelation. This spooky magic stuff. And so therefore, our culture, for several hundred years now, has been dominated by that kind of thinking. Thomas Jefferson pushed it. It's about what you can figure out. Our seminaries picked up on it. Christianity picked up on it and has really made reason above revelation. How do I know that? Because you don't want to be gullible, do you? A lot of people are afraid of being dishonest and gullible. Well, okay, but I use my head. God didn't require me to check my brains at the door, and he doesn't. But the fact of the matter is, is that revelation, in other words, communication through his spirit, is to dominate our lives. How do I know whether or not that's happening in my own life? I, on Sunday morning, get up and declare the miraculous power, working power of God. I lay hands on people and they are slain in the spirit. I say, yes, God, it's all about your power. And then my son breaks his leg and he is threatened with gangrene. And I go, oh, my God. Or my daughter comes back with a diagnosis of cancer. And I go, oh, my God. And then we put reason together. We reason this step to this step to this step. If we don't do this and this and this and this, you know, this is the ultimate conclusion here. We don't rely upon primarily revelation. I'll tell you, you'll become one of the smartest people in the world if you'll rely on revelation. Because the Holy Spirit will teach you stuff you would not have learned otherwise. But he will also bring peace and joy with it. And love, you won't have to try to make it up. Because Thomas Jefferson in a Declaration of Independence, that stuff has filtered itself into the whole framework and fabric about how secular and spiritual, if there is such a thing, religious and non-religious people think. Because we're bombarded with it. So it needs to go back to Seeking God means you believe in a revelation God. A God of the spirit realm. A God of the spirit realm that dominates the natural realm. And having confidence in him. And so what I, what, one of the things that I'm going to share with you is that something that's on my miracle list is because of diabetes... I have certain conditions of neuropathy in my feet and legs 
in various parts of my body where the nerves have been killed. It will take an absolute miracle for those nerves to be restored. That won't be just a healing. That will be a miracle. Now, it will include healing because there's some of the nerves, most of the nerves in my body that are damaged at all are still functioning and alive to a degree. But there are some that have completely died, nerve endings that have died, and I can't feel anything. It's because they're dead. So therefore, this is on my miracle list. But you know how I am applying it, and it's really easy. Everybody can do it. Would God want to do that? Well, his word says he can do that. He performs miracles, and so let's go for the miracle. But number two, it's as simple as saying, I say yes to my neuropathy miracle. And every time it comes to my mind, I just say, I say yes to my neuropathy miracle. I'm not looking for when it is complete. I'm just simply saying, I say yes to my neuropathy miracle. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. Do you know following God is really, Deborah, basically as simple as saying, I say yes, God. I say yes to you today. I say yes to your word ways today. I say yes to your life today. I say yes to your words today. I say yes, Lord. And because you are a miracle worker, and that is one of the chief things that we have lost in the Christian world, is that there are practical ways to apply that that don't have anything to do with a church service or a big healing crusade. It has to do with just your own life that you live. I, so whatever the rheumatoid arthritis is and the root of it and genetically, I say yes to my rheumatoid arthritis miracle. You completely recreate the DNA. Can I actually do that? Yeah. Why can't I do that? Because he does miracles. Because he is the God of miracles. And a miracle is something that is done that doesn't previously exist. It's absolutely impossible unless there is a miracle working entity that gets involved with it and does it just like he created the world and shows you how to cooperate with it. Is that all I do? Say yes to this, Lord? Yeah, until you get a revelation of how to cooperate with it. As you get revelations in how to cooperate with it, then you cooperate with it. Along with, I say yes, Lord, to my miracle. So I'm asking you, I'm, I'm suggesting to you to consider your options. Stay with all the miracles you need and not get any. Or start receiving miracles in your life. That's, that's really two options. <laughs> Keep them. Or receive miracles. Amen. Keep the death or receive miracles. Amen. Keep the destruction or receive miracles. Amen. It's one way or the other. I say yes to you, God. I say yes to peace, Lord. I say yes to joy, Lord. I say yes when everything seems impossible. Well, the thing is, the very thing you're the best at, besides everything is working miracles. And if it's a miracle, it doesn't exist until he does it.